Hello and good morning from Toronto, Canada. My name is Anna Sangster from the International Federation on Aging, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to the next webinar in our age-friendly webinar series entitled, The Role of Advocacy and Resilience in Age-Friendly Environments. It is a great privilege today to be joined by Dr. Jean Barrett, Secretary General of the International Federation on Aging. Listing her many accolades would likely take the better part of this hour, so I will try to do justice despite the brevity. Dr. Barrett is a renowned expert and thought leader in the field of aging. Her dedication and tireless efforts have been instrumental in ensuring that the rights of older people are protected and ever present as we enter this period of unprecedented population aging. Dr. Barrett is also responsible for the oversight of the IFA's work with WHO as it relates to age-friendly cities and communities and has spoken internationally countless times on the topic of age-friendly environments. Now, before diving in, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions throughout this webinar, please feel free to write these down and submit them via the Q&A function, and Dr. Barrett can then answer these during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Please also remember to use the Q&A function rather than the chat function to submit any questions, as this allows us to take record of any questions that are unanswered. Now, thank you again for joining us today, and without further ado, I will pass things over to you, Jane. And thank you very much, Anna, for those kind words. Um, oh, and... Uh, all right, and we're off. Um, it is my great pleasure to be talking with you today about age-friendly environments in the context of healthy ageing. But first and foremost, I want to pay tribute to um, Anna Sangster, who is Program Manager at IFA and is the project lead for age-friendly cities and communities and taking a leadership role in our role as Secretariat for the Global Network of Age-Friendly Cities and Communities. So thank you very much. Um, when I think and talk about age-friendly environments, I'm really thinking and talking it about it from a historical perspective, but also from what comes next. Um, this program has been operating since 2007. So I'm really trying to give you a flavour of what I believe and IFA believes will be the next steps going forward. So here's a bit of a, a roadmap to the presentation today. I'm going to give you some historical perspectives, but I'm really going to focus on three different aspects of how we talk and think about older people, but the issues that they're experiencing, and that is resilience, ageism, and brain health. And put these three aspects within the framework of age-friendly cities. So I always like to think um, about what, what is the definition of what we're really talking about here. And when we define resilience, um, we, can, we can also create an image of older people that we've known and, and we talk about their resilience. And, you know, one of my favourite and remarkable women in my life is my mum, Billy, who's 92, whose resilience since Dad died you know, nearly two years ago is nothing short of remarkable. You know, not having lived by herself ever in her life, now to take on the, the, the role of, um, as she would say, chief cook and bottle washer and everything in between. Um, we also have this paradox that um, we, we see that as our, as our body declines, resilience and positivity you know, often, but not always, prevail. So historically, where have we come? And many people on this line will actually um, know the name of Alex Kalash, because Alex Kalash was, you know, the key figurehead in 2007, you know, that conducted the first ever, with many cities around the world, but the first ever um, focus groups on age-friendly environments. But we, we can also go back a little bit further. And there's three kind of buckets of frameworks, plans, in which I can talk about age-friendly very easily. Uh, one of them is MIPA, the UN Madrid International Plan of Action on Aging. Another group are the developmental goals, of which we know SDGs and of course the UN Open Ender Working Group. And then you have a whole group of frameworks, plans, strategies within the WHO environment. But I can clearly say that there is a thread that goes through the international plans, you know, the development goals and the work at, at uh, WHO. And, you know, MIPA, you know, was when I first and foremost um, work, started to, to work and think in the field of ageing. 
And these are the three priorities for MIPA. And even at that time, back in 2002, you can see enabling and supportive environments is very clearly one of the three priorities. And then Dr. Alex Kalash's work around active ageing and age-friendly environments, policy frameworks, you know, participation, health and security, the social determinants, these are the very building blocks of an age-friendly community. You know, we had the Millennium Development Goals and, you know, we can see also within that framework, the aspirational goals of environmental challenges in which older people live today. You know, we talk very much um, in the field of ageing about inequity, about poverty, about social exclusion, and that was the first Millennium Development Goal. Then we've moved from 2007 and, and right up until 2015, we were talking about what I see as the structural domains of an age-friendly city. And they've been quite clearly um, put in different logos. Sometimes you have the flower logo, but it's always those um, structural domains. But I think we've moved on from there and that's really what I want the basis of this uh, conversation to be. And that is that we've moved into understanding the relationship between the functional domains and the structural domains. So I now think about if communication and information does not enable an older person to participate, how does that impact on their functional domains? So it could impact you know, relationships to, as, as, as a beginning and also basic needs. If we think about the 2007 framework, and Aoife did a lot of work at Age Friendly City of Akita, and there were very much um, structural domains there that we were focusing on. So slippery footpaths, you know, big signs, um, you know, and we did an assessment of the physical environment. But I think we need to be also going forward now and understanding how we can talk about the nuances of brain health, resilience, you know, within an age-friendly uh, purview. So here are the sustainable development goals of which there are 17. And we also know, and the blue dots indicate, we also know that they have a direct relationship to ageing and health. And as we move forward, we also consider the UN Open End of Working Group. And this year, we're going to be looking at the right to work and access to the labour market and access to ju justice. But we need to also go back and put that in the framework of the structural domains and also the functional domains. So just when we're talking about labour market, you know, are we also able to talk within an age-friendly framework you know, around employment policies? Are we able to talk about the physical environment? Are we able to talk about um, modified work practices so an older person can continue? So that's how we need to be sort of pulling apart the notion of age friendly. 2015 was a standout year for our field because it was the first evidence-based report on ageing and health, led by Dr. John Beard and a team of stellar professionals who remain within the WHO um, work today. So Alana Officer, Ritu Sadana, and also Islaini Di Carvello. And their priorities were very clear. And number two, developing age-friendly environments. But you can also see that number one, number three, number four, number five, you know, they are part of developing an age-friendly environment. You know, Aoife and others talk about how do we create an environment that enables an older person to do what they reasonably should value. Um, 2020, I think, is the year of the tipping point because we are very hopeful that the 1st of October 2020, the Decade of Healthy Ageing will be launched. We know that there are four 
pipelines for domains um, that member states, governments are being asked to speak to. One of them is how we think, feel and act. Ageism, prejudice, age discrimination. Secondly, creating age-friendly cities and communities, providing older people who need it access to long-term care and strengthening primary health care to be responsive. And that is also linked to the SDGs and the same messages can be pulled through to the Madrid International Plan of Action on Ageing for which member states, governments are asked to be accountable every four years. I just want to also, you know, raise to your attention that in 2019, there was something called the G20. And it was quite clear that age-friendly environments was on the agenda of the G20 nations. And I can go even further and say at the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation uh, in 2019, where IFA spoke in Chile, many governments in their formal statements were talking about age friendliness. So we have the planets almost becoming aligned, haven't we? You know, we've got the decade being launched, we've got SDGs, we've got the evidence-based uh, report from WHO, we've also got the strategic priorities, but how do we really talk about age friendly cities and communities now in a way that is not only about, you know, the height of seats or benches or timing of traffic lights or communication, how can we have a nuanced conversation about some of the, the, the sticking points about growing older, about ageism, about cognition, and also about resilience. So let's move on to, first of all, thinking about the life course approach to health. And health is not only the physical health, it's social, it's economical, it's psychological, it's your mental health, health, mental health and well-being. When we talk about a life course approach to health, we're thinking not only about the intrinsic capacity. And what I mean by that is, you know, the physical, the social, the economic, the lifestyle decisions that we make where we're born, um, the family that we're born into. We know that people that are born into a disadvantaged community have a, a, a decreased healthy life expectancy. So we know that people with uh, limited education will have lower health expectancy. They will have different disease medical conditions that they have to deal with. And so an age-friendly environment speaks not only to the intrinsic capacity of a person, but also to their functional ability. So it should always be our conversation, not about whether someone has diabetes or, or uh, chronic obstructive airways disease, but what is their functional ability and how can we actually create an environment that will not only maintain, but will improve their functional ability. So let's move on to talking about resilience, ageism and brain health in the context of age-friendly cities. I put this um, image up here because it came across my desk, my Facebook account, um, probably in October. And it really struck me um, that, you know, within the space of a month, there'd been over 50,000 likes on my LinkedIn post. And it related to this image. And I was trying to understand whether it was about President Jimmy Carter, you know, the, 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 the comments, the praise, the endorsement, or actually whether it, it spoke to this resilience of an older person. And I think it's both, but it just showed to me that um, we really value older people, their resilience, their courage, their life experiences, you know, what they, they bring to every conversation that we have. And if we take that kind of conversation into our work in age friendly, what does that mean? Is it a different conversation or is it the same conversation? So I set about to try and look at how we could how we could understand some of the 
the, the social issues that we talk about and place them into a context of age friendly. So when we talk about social isolation, loneliness, you know, there's evidence that there are increased risks for very clearly measurable medical conditions. So blood pressure, heart disease, obesity, Alzheimer's disease, and even death. So there's a relationship between isolation, loneliness, and physical changes. So then if we looked at age friendly, before I do that, um, here's one of the reports from Anna Goulding around the relationship between resilience and ageing. And one of the key positive characteristics, as you can see, is if there's a strong social network and engagement in physical activity, you know, that actually maintains and improves resilience. But I'd just like to just give you a bit of an anecdote here. So let's think about a person that has a deteriorating hearing function. And this deteriorating hearing actually impacts on their ability to be part of a social support network. So one of our roles at EFA is really to ensure that there is access to hearing screening and treatment for hearing changes and also assistive devices. But you see, we can't talk about resilience if we actually don't understand that it may be changing because of something down the line, something that an individual is experiencing, or as we know, that much, many of um, you know, our friends and family, as we grow older, then they pass away, and so there's less of a social network. And then of course, you've got the transportation issues. So we need to actually work down line and also up line. So, this is an age-friendly practice, and it's an intergenerational space, um, bringing together people of all generations and using different languages. And this is a, a platform, a coming together, exchanging skills, encouraging social networks, and it's across generations. So I could see that this example of an age-friendly practice actually speaks to the social issue of isolation. Similarly, uh, the work around dementia friendly cities is certainly growing throughout the world. And I'm conscious that many of you would know this. Um, and we can see that there are structural changes in dementia friendly cities that will enable people with dementia and their families to join. But what struck me of, of greater interest was the fact that some companies are now actually having training for their staff, for people uh, to accommodate and support people with dementia and their families. So not only are we seeing that, you know, the physical setting of cinemas may change, but we're also seeing that there is a community willingness to understand some of the characteristics that people with dementia are experiencing and being part and, and helping them to be part of community. So there are two examples around, you know, social isolation and speaking to resilience. If we look into the evidence and the impact of ageism, and I just want to shout out the work of WHO and the evidence that they have commissioned around ageism, and also the interventions that uh, impact and can accommodate and change age, age discrimination. So we know that there are physical consequences and mental consequences for ageism. Shorter life span and Alana Officer, you know, certainly reports that um, someone that experiences discrimination and ageism, it can mean that they have seven less years and that's significant but poorer recovery from disability, impaired cognition, distress and loneliness, increased morbidity. And then you can see that these aspects of the impact of aging, ageism can actually feed into, you know, the decrease in resilience. So 
here's one of the studies that um, you know WHO commissioned in the American Journal of Public Health, and you can see that um, it's quite clear that the impact of ageism interventions can actually support older people, but not only support older people, but it's across generations. And it's both confronting the message, but also having an intergenerational um, intervention. So older people talking to younger people and vice versa. But it's not only talking, it's about working together. Um, here is an example of age-friendly good practice that has won awards in South Australia. And it really is a video series, The Unley Legends, um, inspiring legends of the Unley community, um, still young at heart. So that's a series that has also now gone viral throughout Australia. Um, now, this isn't um, a reported age-friendly practice. But I came across it in my research and study and really felt that, you know, sometimes there are age friendly things going on, but they're not reported in the context of age friendly. They're not promoted, but they really are doing something more across generations and purposeful around some global issues. Um, and so this was reported in, in China Daily and it was about a community and there were particular names for the women and the men, Arrow Associations for the men and sorority women. And ordinarily, you know, they would organise and raise funds for village entertainment, etc. You know, they live in a, a very remote part of Yunnan province and women traditionally work, um, you know, in, in fairly uh, labour intensive um, employment and men focus on climate change. And what we saw during the course of um, working together, you know, women across generations started to be responsible and be part of the conversation around climate change. And so they connected with villages up river because they understood that what was happening up river was impacting their community down river. And so through that interaction of community to community, then they're now working around how to support not only the natural environment, but working across generations. Now, in, in our terms, that would be known as an age-friendly practice. You know, so I'm, I'm just conscious that we really need to listen and look and see what's going on around the world because much of our work is across generations and it is supportive of an age-friendly city and community. Another um, example of a response to ageism and discrimination is the Porto Social Foundation who came together with the Academic, Academic Federation of Porto. And this is an example of co-generational accommodation but it really is in some of the poorest parts of Portugal. And the name of it is, in, in English, is coziness. And they came together because um, seniors wanted to be autonomous and continue that, but there was a real need for students to actually be able to continue with their education in low cost accommodation. And so this is a movement that's certainly been replicated, you know, in Lisbon and Coimbra. And there are examples I know in Australia, the United Kingdom and Canada and probably many other parts of the world. So I've given you some examples of how I see age friendly practices in the context of resilience and then in the context of ageism. And now we just move on to some examples in the context of brain health. Uh, and cognitive health. So IFA has been really interested in the area of cognitive reserve for some time and convened a think tank of key experts from around the world uh, to understand the evidence that was available that could inform policy development. And just in October 2019, 
um, we had the IFA Copenhagen Summit on Cognitive Reserve. And indeed, we had the best of the best thinkers and researchers around the world. And I believe that there's a, a report um, on our website. But what I wanted to talk with you about today is that we actually know that there's a relationship between hearing loss, sight loss, and cognition. And we also know that there are um, lifestyle decisions that impact um, cognitive change. One of the key statements that was made at the summit that uh, remains with me um, is the treatment for dementia is prevention. And so we know how to slow down, minimize, prevent you know, some cognitive changes. And so you can see just with the, um, the image on the left that people with less education, there'll be an increase in the cases of dementia. Hearing loss, hypertension, obesity, smoking, depression, physical inactivity, social isolation and diabetes. So we know what actually gives rise to some cognitive changes. And here in another image is Latin America, India and China and scientific evidence about the impact of what I just talked about within their framework. It's stunning that in Latin America, for example, there's potentially 56% modifiable factors, 41% in India and 40% in China. You know, what about, where does this fit into an age-friendly cities plan? How could we use this evidence within the age-friendly plan and actually start responding to some of the greatest fears that older people have, and that is losing their mind, um, having dementia. So one of the ways that we can do this is put it into context. So a great example is ICAPS for older people in Sri Lanka. So if we think back to what I've just, I've just shared, you know, there's a relationship between vision loss, hearing loss, and cognitive changes. So an example of eye camps in Sri Lanka, and there are many all over the world, really speaks to this issue of also decreasing the prevalence of dementia. And I'm not saying dementia in the broader sense, but the relationship is very clear and we need to pay attention to it. You know, similarly, visual arts in the resilience of people living with dementia in care homes. Um, and, and once again, these are, these are examples that we can not only replicate, but we can learn from the expression of art demonstrating resilience. Another example is Rock Through the Ages in Kent. We also know that there's a relationship between activity and dementia and Minds in Motion, Northumberland, United Kingdom. Um, as it says, change in the lives of people with Alzheimer's disease and memory loss. So it's about social engagement. It's about you know, the devotion of time with one another and cognitive stimulation. So in each of those examples, what I've tried to demonstrate is that there is evidence to actually support um, within an age-friendly environment, attention to resilience, attention to ageism, and attention to brain health. And there would be many other aspects that you could tie into the age-friendly plan. And I urge you to do that because I think that it's time that we certainly take on board the physical environment and what needs to be done but also speak to some of the other challenges such as marginalisation, isolation, dementia, vision health, hearing health, you know, within the framework of age friendly. So how do we communicate our agenda? Um, as a former academic, I can, I can certainly say that I felt the moral duty to improve public health policy. One of the challenges as an academic 
is the, the time lag it takes from doing the research to actually seeing it in publication, but also most importantly, to actually informing policy and practice. So there's certainly not a tangential line, it's not direct, and it takes a long time. I think from a policymaker's perspective, you know, academic literature doesn't neatly translate into policy that can improve the status quo. So I think that there is a disconnect often between the academic and the policymaker, and that's where organised such as organisations such as EFA and others need to step up and help translate that evidence into practice. And certainly people like Professor Michael Valenzuela um, from Sydney in the area of cognitive change, you know, that's one of his remits to actually take the science of brain health and cognitive reserve and transform it into policy. I think, you know, it, it's, it's important that this quote came from a New South Wales public servant uh, from Australia. Um, so what he's saying is more and more data doesn't help. You've got to show what the data means, why it's significant to policy. And that comes within what is the narrative? What is the business case? What is it going to do to support older people within the framework of, you know, the, the policy maker? And so I think that these are, are three very, very important statements, you know, about um, that, that we can talk about within an age friendly environment. So I step back now and just mention just a little bit about Age friend, uh, not age friendly, um, IFA. Um, IFA, we now talk about IFA as driving the agenda of the world's aging population. We're certainly an international advocate, and one of our primary jobs at a national level is to help build the capacity of others in an unconditional way. So, one of the ways of doing that is to bring together experts and expertise. Um, but we do beyond um, the usual culprits. You know, when we're talking about vision health and bringing experts together, we'll certainly bring the retinal specialist, the ophthalmologist, the optometrist, but we also bring public health to the table. We could also bring urban planners to the table. Of course, older people to the table, but also those that may have diabetic retinopathy to the table. You know, now is the time in 2020 to actually really drive an agenda across disciplines and across sectors. And it is only through that multi-sectoral relationship, multidisciplinary relationships, that we're going to move the agenda forward in a very practical way. Uh, we do speak about ageing and older people in quite a different way now. And these are some of our statements. You know, age is not a four letter word. Resilience doesn't age and equality doesn't get old. Here are some takeaway messages from the webinar today. First of all, age friendly cities and communities are maturing in their understanding, in their interventions, and they are being embedded. And now is the time to actually push forward in a deeper understanding of what it needs, what it means to be age friendly. We can speak about resilience. We can speak about ageism and dementia and isolation and marginalization. Because you know, mental health issues, as an example, is really pivotal to an older person remaining healthy and within community. Secondly, EFA believes that co-creation is at the heart of age friendly. It doesn't and cannot sit with government. It doesn't and cannot sit with gerontologists, geriatricians. It is an across the board conversation. And if we're smart, we will make it across the board conversation that includes industry, you know, as well as not-for-profit, as well as government. The very reason that EFA membership is made up of government, 
non-government, academia, older people and industry is testament to our mission of all of those need to be at the table to influence and shape policy. And finally, our values define who we are, what we do and how we do it every single moment of the day. As an individual, I have to live and breathe by my values and I fail almost every day on something. However, age friendly must be underpinned by values that we believe in, values that we know can change the current status and values that are meaningful to whoever we're speaking to. And if they are not understanding, we need to change our conversation. Because it's sometimes like speaking a different language. So it's our responsibility to actually change the narrative so it's meaningful to the other person. And just in closing, before we open it up to questions, um, I put my hand on my heart and uh, just let you know that our global conference um, is from the 1st to the 3rd of November in 2020. Uh, one third of the papers in 2018 was on age-friendly cities and communities. Um, on the 31st of October, we have one day that's dedicated to age-friendly, where we'll be talking about sustainability, about measurement, about good practices, about the next generation of age-friendly cities and communities. You know, WHO within our membership framework of the global members of age-friendly cities and communities have over a thousand members and that's growing rapidly. And, you know, it's interesting that it's growing rapidly in Latin America. We also have within the conference um, the age-friendly global village. So age-friendly is spelt with the D before the L, but we have an age-friendly global village. And the reason that we're having that is because many cities and communities, you know, need to showcase what they're doing. But this is a time to also network informally, learn from one another, um, perhaps develop partnerships and MOUs and collaboration but some of the best thinkers and doers in Age Friendly will be part of the Global Village. So thank you very much for being on the call with me today. I hope that the way that I've talked about Age Friendly has actually sparked some ideas and I'm very happy to uh, you know, respond to any questions, Anna. Thanks so much, Jane. That was fantastic. It's really nice to be able to step back every once in a while and kind of see how all of those pieces fit together. Um, so I think our first question, we actually have a first question from Xenia, uh, and she's asking, she, well, she says, labor market issues concerned female caregivers who gave up their jobs and income to provide support to family members. How could politicians be made aware that they need public support, such as job security, to be able to return to the labor market, income compensation, and adequate social protection, example, for health and old age, to ensure their own life? Um, look, thanks, Xenia, and for those on the call, <coughs> Um, Xenia is um, very proudly um, uh, representative at the WHO on behalf of IFA. So thank you, Xenia. And Xenia, you're an expert in this field, not, not me. But, but I'll, I'll make some comments about it. I think that the whole area of female caregivers is relatively underplayed in the context of them returning to work. And I think that what we need to understand is that labour market policies actually don't, are, are never up to date with what's happening with demographic changes and also the context of family caregiving. I think, you know, in, in time past, we've made an assumption that family caregivers are spouses of, of um, those that are ill, which in large cases it is. However, more and more we will see um, adult children and predominantly um, IF, uh, predominantly uh, women uh, taking up the, uh, the, the mantle. One of the great difficulties is not only retraining, but also being part of the labour market. And so what we've got to put in place is 
um, employment training. Uh, we've also got to advocate for greater job security when somebody actually becomes the caregiver. But I've also got to say that we need to think about what are the, what are the services provided to support a person um, who is ill. What my sense is that more and more governments are actually saying, well, the family will do this. And I think we're seeing a very unbalanced situation because family caregivers are not necessarily skilled in the high level intensive services that are required. So it's a big policy around not only job security and labor market and training, but it's also about what is the model for sound and safe formal care for their loved one. Thanks so much, Jane. Okay, um, Betsy has a question, uh, Betsy Wherley. I'm hearing more about age-friendly universities and would appreciate a comment about how they fit into age-friendly cities work. Are there age-friendly programs emerging in other sectors? Um, thanks, thanks, Betsy, and uh, it's great to hear you. And thank you for your contributions to um, the 2018 um, conference. They were, they were masterful. Um, I know that there is a great movement around age-friendly universities. The relationship between age friendly universities and the global network of age friendly cities and communities hasn't yet been aligned. But I know that Alana and her team at WHO are talking with um, various universities to better understand what kind of relationship that there is. I think the same can be said for the movement around age friendly businesses. And so what I would see in the future is that different sectors seeing the value of um, age-friendly, the age-friendly movement and setting up these satellite pieces that must link through into the, um, the global network. I think what would probably be smart though too is that if, if an age-friendly city actually made the relationship, built the bridge or vice versa, the university with the city. So it was within the umbrella of the plan of a government that they supported and recognised the work of the university. And with that, you get a much more solid, comprehensive framework and narrative rather than satellite um, conversations. Right, we'll move on to a question from Megan Wolf. Uh, both age-friendly public health and age-friendly health systems are emerging across the US. What are the prospects for an emerging of all age-friendly initiatives into an age-friendly ecosystem? Uh, Megan, um, thank you for your question. And it's, it's uh, an issue that's been raised by Stephanie Firestone um, just last week, I think. Um, and so she has alerted certainly WHO and others around uh, the emergence of this, of this age-friendly public health and age-friendly health systems. I think it's a really important conversation to have. Um, when you say what are the prospects for an emerging of all age-friendly initiatives in an age-friendly ecosystem, I'm not sure what you mean by an age-friendly ecosystem, but I'm, what I'm sure of is that the more there is a conversation and roots put down around an age-friendly health system, public health, then the greater awareness of the issues that older people have and the greater response to them. So I think it's also a chicken and an egg. I'm also conscious that um, an age-friendly public health system must be friendly for all ages. So it's about how do we create the narrative to bring everybody along and not exclude anybody. Thanks, Jan and Megan, for that question. Uh, moving on to a question from Evan. He says, are issues unique to LGBTQ plus seniors being addressed in any capacity? Now, I'm not sure whether this is related to the IFA conference or for age friendly environments, but maybe you can speak a little bit to both, Jane. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, Evan, you know, IFA has taken a, a continuing and greater interest in older LGBTQI too issues. Uh, you know, what we understand is that um, they are very particular to this subpopulation. So I haven't, I'm not aware of LGBTQ plus 
seeing as issues within an age-friendly framework. And I can take that question on notice and explore it um, further. Um, but you can count on um, Aoife um, certainly being part of the conversation. In 2018, we joined with um, other organisations um, to sign a pledge to protect and support uh, the rights of older LGBTQI2 uh, people. And that will continue into 2018. And just yesterday, um, Aoife was talking with um, an organisation in the United States about um, older people who have HIV and how do we support the agenda that's going on there. So I'll take that question on notice in the context of age friendly and get back to you, Evan. Thanks, Jane. Uh, so a few questions from myself, actually. Um, I know we talked about, you talked about essentially the gap between research and policy uh, and kind of the, the importance of multi-sectoral kind of collaboration um, in that field uh, or to kind of to, to drive from kind of evidence to action, as you said. Um, I know Simon Chapman, who, who attended, who was kind enough to attend the Copenhagen Summit, talked a lot about advocacy and kind of how, how, how does that actually look? How do we translate that evidence into action? I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that and some of the kind of strategies that he discussed. Mm, certainly. Um, and for, the, for those that don't know Simon Chapman, I suggest that you, you click onto his, um, we, his website and his Instagram and his Twitter account uh, Professor Simon Chapman, um, just to give you context, was a trailblazer in advocating and helping to inform policy against tobacco. And Australia proudly is one of those nations where, you know, smoking, um, you know, has been on the decrease for, for many, many years. Um, so Simon is at the forefront of understanding how to, to advocate. One, evidence, 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 to um, have the conversation with anybody that wants to listen to it, three, use media relentlessly, four, be courageous and bold with the statements, with your evidence behind you, and also to actually build a network beyond, uh, beyond those that you know. Um, reach out across the ocean, but also across the sectors and disciplines. So um, Simon Chapman uh, is well worth following because um, even though his, his um, reason for being was around the public health issue of tobacco, um, he has gone on to really use his advocacy skills and his extraordinary skills as an epidemiologist to actually fight other battles. So Simon Chapman from Australia, worth connecting with. Thanks so much, Jane. A uh, question from Mark. Uh, to what extent has age has the age friendly movement been brought to awareness in schools, colleges, um, and in learning courses, for example? Yeah, um, Mark. I don't know of any at a schools level. Um, at a college, they are often part of um, you know university movement, and I know that in Canada, the Sheridan Elder Research Centre in Oakville. Um, is, is, a, is a great example. Um, I think what we can do, Mark, is connect you with uh, Christine O'Kelly um, in Ireland, and she would certainly um, know a little bit more about that, that area. Thanks, Jane. Okay, a question from Brittany Perez. Uh, she says, what has the role of universal design in age-friendly communities in your experience? How could the adoption of universal design and universal design thinking become more widespread? Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. Um, and I, I didn't pick that up, but I'm, I can read it. Um, first of all, Brittany, I think that you just let us know that in Buffalo, you have a fairly robust and exciting um, program responding to the needs of uh, older LGBT. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, she can't. She can't speak, but she but she has said that. So we're going to connect. I can, if Brittany, if you can put up your hand at all, there's a an icon that lets you do that. We can we can let you. Oh, there she is. We'll let Brittany talk for a little bit. Here you go, Brittany. Okay. Can you hear us, Brittany? I can hear you, but I'm not sure if you can hear me. I can hear you perfectly. Oh, perfect. So here in Buffalo, New York, uh, we had. Uh, 
collaboration created through our age-friendly movement between uh, our Pride Center for Western New York and Erie County Senior Services uh, Department. And so what has happened is um, in both directions, there's a, a mutual relationship now. The community who attended the Pride Center felt like some of the mainstream senior services offered by the county weren't necessarily um, as open or educated about the needs of aging LGBTQ seniors. And so they wanted um, to have some education and training uh, for the social workers and case managers and uh, other people in service through those departments, which took place, um, as well as having someone from the Pride Center um, on the board of the Senior Services Department. And then vice versa, the Senior Services Department has been able to help the Pride Center integrate some of their um, services into the Pride Center's work so that there are older adult services through the Pride Center. So if people are already members um, there, they can learn about those things and take advantage of things like transportation programs or um, dementia-related programming. Um, and then maybe one of the most exciting things is the Silver Pride group, um, which which is a group of older adults who have regular lunches together, talk about different social issues, um, and have really become a robust social community for the older adult LGBTQ community here. Um, and what we've learned from all of this is that while there's a lot of similar needs in those aging communities, um, there are also a lot of unique needs that we need to be sensitive to. And this goes for any kinds of different populations. And so we're trying to do that work in our age-friendly communities here in Western New York. Okay, thanks very much for that, Brittany. Um, Brittany, you, you asked a question about the adoption of universal design. Um, and, you know, what I think we need to be doing is not necessarily adopting universal design or universal design thinking or accessible design thinking. I think we've actually got to learn from that whole movement. You know, UD and AD was around when, you know, I was at university in the 80s. So I, I think, I think, just the same as we have smart cities and healthy cities and thinking cities, um, it, it would be useful to pull through the learnings of those various movements to support sustainable and, and thoughtful approaches in age-friendly. I do believe that we need to be, go beyond the physical infrastructure. And if I speak to the question from Maria about isolation, I think intergenerational programs are, are quite evident, you know, in many countries. But I think we've actually got to go even deeper onto that because some people do not want to join, you know, an intergenerational program. You know, they don't want to uh, be part of, you know, talking with younger people. They, they actually want to be part of a community of, 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 the same age or similar. Or I think we've got to go back to the, the statement, um, older people are not a homogeneous group. You know, each, each person is unique and they all have their different um, wishes and wants. And I'll, I'll give you another anecdote. And that's my dear mum this morning who went out shopping. She has very bad mobility. And she said, I had a really interesting conversation sitting with someone at the doctors. And this conversation must have gone on for, for quite a few minutes. But that was just as important to my mum as going to um, Probus and listening to a speaker. So sometimes we're very quick to try and put programs in place when in fact that may not be you know, the best, best way forward. Um, I just speak to, you know, Roger Gervais, who said, my concern with universal design of housing is that most advocates, et cetera, are largely working in silos. We need a coordinated approach. Um, look, I couldn't agree more, Roger. I think when we're in a particular discipline, we actually think that we know we have all the answers and that's not the case. So, with UD of housing or even um, co-generational housing. You know, we've actually got to go back to the basics and, and not assume that we know what an older person wants. Um, 
Adita um, in Lithuania, Chair of Older Persons Association, welcome. Um, her question is, what would you advise to reduce ageism inside the older persons cohort? Active and successfully ageing older persons not willing to mingle with those having dementia and cognitive decline. I think, isn't that such a great question, Edita? Um, what would I advise? Um, I think that what, what could work, and I, I've, I've got no quick answers. I think that you really do have to have a conversation with, with, with those that are active and successfully ageing, whatever that means, you know, about the challenges of, of, of cognitive change. Um, because we are who we are at this moment in time, but tomorrow we may have different functional abilities. It may be useful to actually start a process of talks, you know, experts coming in and talking. And one of them could be around brain health or cognitive changes. So that may be a way, instead of confronting it, actually have conversations about what it is. I think it's also very useful to see if a person who has cognitive decline or dementia is willing to talk, or those that love them would be willing to talk, a family person, because I think that also gives a different perspective. You know, people with cognitive decline certainly have windows of great clarity. And in that moment of great clarity, those that don't have dementia actually really get some very clear messages. So that may be a way forward. Um, we also have a comment from Javier. Um, thanks, Javier, for your, for your comment. And you're, you're saying that, that at the Academy on Age-Friendly Environments in Europe, great, I didn't know that you were there, but that's great. We are also promoting design and implementation of AFEs and hands-on work. Happy to organise study tours to AF cities and communities. And uh, we certainly will um, share your, your contact details and we're happy to do that for anybody. So I hand it over to you, um, Anna. Thanks so much, Jan, and thanks for everybody that's uh, that's joined us this morning and lobbed in some questions. It's fantastic, and we hope that you'll all join us for our, for our next um, webinar in this series, and we'll be sure, as Jana said, to follow up on any questions that didn't get answered today and distribute any materials that anyone would like to disseminate. So thanks again, and thank you so much, Jane, for being with us this morning. Thank you, and come to the IFA conference November in Niagara. Yes, yes, please. <laughs> Bye, everybody.